I want to thank everyone for again tuning in today. I very much appreciate it and I continue to hear from people that they find the rhythm of these events to be helpful and calming. So I would encourage you to continue to tune in um, and learn everything there is to learn around how you can keep yourselves and your family safe, how you can reopen your business, how you can be successful through phase two as we continue to live with the coronavirus in Rhode Island. Uh, I'll be here tomorrow at 1 o'clock, and as a reminder, starting next week, we are going to do the 1 o'clock press conference Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So I'm going to scale back from five days to three days, um, and I look forward to seeing you all uh, next week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 1 o'clock. I will say that um, it is exciting. I find it exciting that we're into phase two. You know, we're going out for dinner again, you know, beginning to send our kids to camp, child care centers opened, we're having an excellent experience so far this week with child care centers, folks are sending me pictures of their kids in these child care centers, so it's, you know, people are going to the beach, the parks are open, people are getting haircuts, it's, it's all good, it's really good, and it's what we want to do, we want to continue to get back to business, and get, get out of the house, get our lives back on track, I will just continue to remind you the virus isn't gone. It is not going to be gone. It's still here. It's still dangerous. It's still particularly dangerous and deadly for older folks and, and people with underlying health conditions. We've just learned how to deal with it. So what that means is even though we are leaving our homes, doing all the great stuff we want to do, please follow the rules. Please, please follow the rules. Social gatherings are limited to 15. If you can work from home, work from home. Wear your masks, wash your hands, stay at home if you're sick. Uh, if you feel sick, call your doctor, get tested. Do not go to work or go anywhere if you feel sick at all. Keep socially distanced. Um, and this is all of us. You know, this is all of us. If we do that, if we double down on the rules, we will continue to reopen the economy and continue to be safe. So I'm going to continue to say that because a lot of, I keep hearing, some people are saying to me, oh, the virus has died down. That's true. It's died down because of you. You've done the great. You've done great work. So continue up your vig continue the vigilance, uh, and also enjoy the fact that we can start living our lives more normally again. Um, we're all oh, we're at 43,000 downloads of the Crush COVID RI app. I'm going to ask you every day download it if you haven't. It takes a minute. I tried to explain why it's so important yesterday. Uh, you're gonna, if you get sick, you're going to get a call from the Department of Health. They're going to want to know who you've had contact with, and they're going to call all of those people to let them know they were in contact with somebody who tested positive. So it'll help everyone and save lives if you can keep your contact tracing notebook and download and use the Crush COVID RI app. Uh, Okay, we'll begin as we always do with the data. If you could put that on the screen, please. As you can see, it's another, another good news day here in Rhode Island. Uh, as you can see, the numbers are continuing to trend in the right direction. We've had another 100 cases to report and very sadly, another 14 deaths. Uh, I'll say as I do every day, every one of those deaths is a loved one. So. Let's just remember that and remember that this suffering is real, it's in our community, and just take a moment to recognize that. Um, but overall, this is a good news story. Hospitalizations continue to trend down. Uh, we are we're into phase two. If, if any of the steps we took in phase one were going to cause a problem in terms of spikes or increases or increased rate of infection, we'd be seeing that now, and we're not. So for those of you who are still worried, have confidence. We, we made a lot of changes in phase one. And if that was going to result in the virus coming back, this is the week we would see it, and we're not. So I feel very good about that. Today I'd like to devote um, the majority of the rest of my time with you talking about our 
health care system. Talking about our health care system, uh, obviously as we've lived through and been fighting together this public health crisis, health care is on everybody's mind. And I will say this, now that we're at this place, we are going to have to begin to turn to the business of rebuilding Rhode Island, rebuilding our economy, rebuilding our communities, and rebuilding our health care system. And we're going to have to do that. The health care system is not going to look the same a year from now as it did when we started this because we've learned a lot. We've had to embrace innovation. And so now when we get to, we, we are committed to it, we need to strengthen our healthcare system, we need to strengthen all areas of our economy, and we need to rebuild in a way that makes our community, our economy, and our healthcare system stronger and more resilient and more effective than it was when we started. Um, there's no question that throughout the past few months, access to quality health care has been absolutely vital for every Rhode Islander. Having said that, in many ways, the virus has brought Rhode Islanders away from the health care system. And we've seen that. You know, we've seen a, a real drop in primary care office visits. We've seen very concerning drops in immunizations among our kids. Uh, we've seen, um, obviously, you know, we essentially closed our hospitals to any non-COVID or non-emergency services. So we've seen disturbing things, you know, cancer patients putting off treatment, patients putting off um, testing or procedures or surgeries. And it's time that we really get serious about addressing that. The virus has also worsened health disparities and highlighted the pressing need to root out inequities in access to health care. By the way, this is an area of top priority for me, also for Dr. Nicole Alexander Scott. You'll see she's not here today. I'm joined by Dr. McDonald. Uh, she's deeply committed to this work. She's also fine and healthy, just working on another project right now. Uh, so we're lucky to have Dr. McDonald. This inequity that we've seen revealed or, or um, spotlighted through the crisis is real and something that we can't accept. So as we get to the business of rebuilding and strengthening our healthcare system, we have to do it in a way where we reduce disparities and inequities that have long existed in our healthcare system. And just like we've invested in housing and food and basic needs to help Rhode Islanders stay healthy through this pandemic, we also need to invest in our health care system to make sure it remains viable, financially secure, responsive to Rhode Islanders' health care needs during the crisis and after the crisis, again, particularly for the most vulnerable among us and in a way that is fair and equal and equitable across the board. Uh, as I said earlier, if we're going to do this, if we're going to shore up the health care system, strengthen it, provide equal access to all Rhode Islanders, uh, we're going to need to get creative. We need to figure out ways that we can get more serious about investing in primary care, about investing in ways that reduce health disparities, about investing in our communities, about investing in prevention, about investing in telemedicine and telehealth so that folks, everyone can have access. We've seen great um, progress with telehealth through the virus. And we need to do it in a way in which we are careful to uh, keep an eye on our costs. We have to, we have to reduce duplication, excess, inefficiency, so that the money we're spending goes to the point of care. Uh, and we have to get serious about providing more care, but also while maintaining our costs. Now, luckily for us here in Rhode Island, long-term commitment to this work has begun long before the COVID crisis through a group of healthcare, government leaders, community leaders, business leaders, um, 
that have been convening for years around this topic. And I should say, I do feel proud to be a Rhode Islander. We have, um, nearly everyone in Rhode Island has health insurance. Nearly every child has health insurance. Uh, in some ways, we have excellent results, and I'm pr proud of that. Clearly, though, there is a lot more work to do. Um, about a year ago, the Rhode Island Foundation uh, put together a group of people with my support to really double down and in think about Rhode Island's health care vision. And later today, I'll be signing an executive order affirming my administration's commitment to that work of health system transformation over the long run and making sure that we have a statewide long-term health care plan focused on improving health for all Rhode Islanders. Um, that means committing to take action to address the economic impacts of COVID on Rhode Island's health care system. And we're also convening um, an advisory group to help us work on that, to work with my administration and my team to enact some of this change. I do want to thank the Rhode Island Foundation for their leadership and also for their commitment of a million dollars to support this work on a go-forward basis. That funding uh, will be used to make ongoing investments, most likely in the form of grants, to root out health disparities and better support preventative health. Uh, I also want to share with you a few things that we're doing right now. So the work I just talked about and the executive order I'm signing is meant to help us have a long-term plan, and we're going to keep working on that to achieve a vision similar to what I laid out. I do want to let you know, though, some of the things we are doing right now, because the reality is our health care system is stretched and fragile in ways that uh, it, I don't know if it's ever been before, and not for a very long time. The reality of this crisis, the COVID crisis, has taken an unbelievable toll on our health care system at a time when people need health care more than ever. Um, and that's in every aspect, financially, the toll on frontline workers, uh, patients, the community. And so it's, it's very important that we're there to shore up our health care system, as I said, so that we come out stronger on the other end. So last week, uh, my administration launched a hospital relief fund. We're committed to investing up to $150 million of the state's emergency COVID relief stimulus money from the federal government to help hospitals offset immediate costs and to prepare for the future. Uh, we've made this funding available to ensure that our hospitals stay open, stay financially viable, stay safe, and are focused on making the changes necessary to remain viable during the crisis, but after the crisis. So the reality is um, we asked hospitals to cut down on the services they were delivering. That means they saw massive drops in their revenue. Now, they did the right thing. At the same time, their costs were increasing. Costs for PPE, costs to meet the COVID crisis, costs for testing. So we need to be there for them. And they need to be there for their frontline workers. And by the way, I'm going to keep saying that, because as we begin the rebuilding of Rhode Island, I want us to keep the frontline workers forefront in our mind, making sure that they have the support and the wages and the retraining that they need in order to be safe and successful and have fulfilling careers. So this money, uh, it's up to $150 million. I, I, there will be more to come. This is like the first immediate emergency tranche a bucket of money to get out to our hospitals to make sure that they can stay financially secure and safe. And I want Rhode Island to hear that. I want you to know we're doing what it's ta it takes to shore up our hospitals. Um, today, I'm also excited to announce that we're going to be convening a new Pediatric Advisory Council led by Dr. Nicole Alexander Scott. We will be also using our COVID emergency relief funds to distribute millions of dollars in relief and support to pediatric practices. Um, pediatric, all, all uh, primary care and physician groups have been hit hard. That is doubly true for pediatric practices. 
Um, they are most heavily dependent on Medicaid, which have lower rates. They haven't had great success with telemedicine. It's obviously harder to do telemedicine with little kids than adults. Um, parents have been afraid to take their kids in for immunizations, to take their kids in for routine care. And so as a result, uh, our pediatricians are hurting and we need to be there for them. They deserve it, but frankly, it's good for Rhode Island. We need a strong system of care in the community. Uh, I think later today, the Department of Health is going to post the names of the pediatricians on their website. And I have tasked this group, I've asked this group to really get a pulse on what's going on and what more do we need to do to keep our kids healthy. Uh, I will tell you, I am very concerned about the fact that through the crisis, we've seen childhood immunizations drop by more than 35%. Some practices say as high as 50%. We need to get on that right now. And I know the pediatricians are ready, so we are going to invest money in pediatricians. We are going to support them, and we're going to come up with creative strategies to make sure that you know parents get their kids back into the pediatrician's office as quickly as possible to get these kids immunized. That's a disaster waiting to happen. 30, 40, 50 percent of our kids missing their immunizations. If we don't fix that now, next winter, that's going to result in could potentially devastating health care issues. So um, if you're a parent and you're hearing me say this and you're still afraid to take your kid to the doctor, I'm asking you please to call the doctor, schedule an appointment, and go ahead and get those immunizations. Um, if you're a pediatrician and you're hearing this, I hope you're hearing me say relief is on the way uh, in terms of support and money. and and we're going to be there with you to help your practices stay open and stay financially viable, and we're going to help with the community supports. Uh, by the way, the same is true. We're seeing the same trends in kids not going to um, primary care physicians, mental health providers. So we really, I really want to encourage everyone, adults and children, if you've been delaying your appointment to the doctor, delaying your appointments, for mental health, delaying your cancer treatments or procedures that you had had scheduled in the hospital, please consider, I'm just asking you please to call the doctor, call the hospital, reschedule, get an appointment and keep yourself healthy. And know that at the same time we are making big investments in our health care system so that you'll get the care that you deserve. Uh, We've also taken great strides, as I said a couple minutes ago, to expand access to health care via telehealth. We have found that, particularly in certain specialties, to be um, an excellent substitute for some in-person visits to the hospital. So through this crisis, I've signed an executive order and worked with our health insurance commissioner to direct health insurers to cover telemedicine for primary care, specialty care, mental and behavioral health care conducted over the phone or video conference, and we have required that reimbursement rates for that telehealth be equivalent to in-person visits. Um, I have extended that executive order. I signed it again last week. I've extended that executive order for another 30 days until July 5th. So if you're a provider who's been caring for your patients through telemedicine, uh, know that you could continue to do that and receive the same payment from insurance companies until July 5th. If you're a patient who's been taking advantage of that, I want you to continue to do that. I'll say we, did, we took that step because we knew everyone needed access to health care during the crisis, and yet it wasn't always safe to leave our homes. It has turned out that through that innovation, like a lot of innovations we're seeing, it's a, it's a great thing to do. It allows us to help equalize health care and get health care to everybody. You can imagine how this is helping people who don't have a car. You can imagine how this is helping people for whom it's just difficult to get to the doctor. So I want to... Um, I want to continue to break down barriers to access for health care. 
again, back to this theme of reducing disparities and improving equity. And one very powerful way to do that has been telehealth. So I've extended the executive order until July 5th, but I want, I want to work to make this permanent through a statute because I think the people of Rhode Island and the providers of Rhode Island deserve a continuation in a stable way of telehealth, not just executive order month to month. Um, in the coming days, I'll be back to share more about additional investments that we'll be making in our health equity zones. You've heard Dr. Alexander Scott talk about that at length. We'll be also be using our COVID stimulus funds to make investments in primary care and other critical areas of our health care system. I would say that as hard as this crisis, the health care crisis is and has been, it also presents opportunity. And as we get to the work of rebuilding Rhode Island, rebuilding our economy, our communities, and our health care systems, let's do it in a way where we bring about the change that will make our systems better for everyone. A lot of these changes I'm talking about and have been talking about, reducing our reliance on institutional settings, increasing home care for our seniors, investing in our frontline workers, making health care rooted in the community and p primary care stronger, enabling telehealth, bringing down costs through greater integration and having a less fragmented, better coordinated healthcare system. These are things we've been talking about for a long time. Let's use the occasion of this crisis to actually take action and drive unprecedented change in our healthcare system in a way that we can, we can increase quality, decrease costs, and build on the strength of our size and have a more coordinated, integrated system. I also want to say thank you. Um, we, for better or for worse, my administration has had a lot of time in the past three or four months talking with people in the healthcare system, um, sometimes on a twice daily basis, talking to hospitals, talking to pediatricians, talking to PCPs, you know, just in the community. They have been talking to nursing homes, talking to home care providers. You have all been unbelievably collaborative, cooperative, creative, and worked with us to meet the crisis. So let's maintain that spirit of partnership and con as we continue to rebuild our system. Um, last thing, it continue related to healthcare. We have talk, talked a lot up here about nursing homes, and I think that, you know, we've learned a lot about nursing homes. Um, we've learned that they take care of so many of our loved ones, and we've learned that infection control is very difficult in these congregate care settings. Uh, we, I am also deeply committed to making sure that every one of our loved ones in a nursing home is safe. So to this point, the state has invested millions and millions of dollars of um, providing increased reimbursement rates for nursing homes, providing them with support from the National Guard for infection control, providing them with um, personal protective equipment for their frontline staff, really um, tens of millions of dollars to shore up our nursing homes to make sure that they are healthy and secure um, to take care of our loved ones. Specifically, I, th I think it was a month or so ago, uh, I announced an effort to provide increased wages to the lowest paid frontline nursing home workers, uh, folks who make $20 an hour or less. And today I'm announcing that we're going to continue that initiative for another two weeks um, through June 15th. This isn't a forever thing, um, I, but it's important for me. These are people who have, some of these people have worked without a day off or very few days off in very, very difficult, scary situations. And frankly, our nursing homes are seeing staffing shortages. So in order to make sure that our homes have the staff they need to take care of folks and that the frontline workers are properly compensated, uh, and by the way, this is all congregate care, DD group homes, um, the Buddha group homes, 
of congregate care settings and nursing homes, I'm extending that increased pay program for another couple of weeks. I have, uh, I know there's a lot of effort in Congress to make sure that in the next federal stimulus relief bill, there's a more permanent measure to support low wage workers in the healthcare industry. That is something I am very supportive of and working with our federal delegation to make happen. In the meantime, we're doing this to meet the immediate need. So um, that's what I have for you today. today